Don't you think that I can see you struggling? Don't you think that I can feel your pain? I hear your cries every time. Greetings and welcome to the Logical Belief Ministries podcast. I'm your host, Jason Mullet. You can visit our website at logicalbelief.org. You can watch these podcasts on YouTube. You can search for and subscribe to our channel there. Uh, you can also find us on iTunes. Just search for Logical Belief. Both the audio and video can be found at our website. Uh, just over there on the right-hand side of the top menu, just go ahead and click on Podcast. Um, if you have a question um, or a word of encouragement that you want to send me, uh, you can just email me at jason at logicalbelief.org. Just be aware, however, that by emailing me, you are permitting me to read it on the air. Alrighty, well today, uh, what we're going to do is uh, we are going to continue our discussion on uh, Roman Catholicism and some of the issues there. And we're going to primarily focus on the the Marian issues within Roman Catholicism. Uh, but before we do that, let me uh, just point out that uh, Wojciech has posted has a new article up there on the website uh, which I would uh, recommend as um, as an evangelistic resource uh, to print this off <coughs> and to give this to your Catholic uh, friends family and relatives uh, it's entitled are you a Roman Catholic and it goes through uh, it distinguishes the gospel uh, according to the Word of God, and distinguishes that with uh, what Roman Catholicism officially teaches. Uh, it goes through uh, the issue that they have with the Ten Commandments, uh, and also goes into uh, the sainthood, um, the canonization that the Roman Catholic Church does in order for someone to become a saint. Uh, he also talks about uh, transubstantiation and uh, it's just a it's a it also talks about uh, I think the rosary some and some of the um, the liturgies and uh, and things that Roman Catholicism does uh, which is opposed to the Word of God it also talks about um, what the scripture says about calling someone your spiritual father so go ahead and uh, check out that article and if you do have friends and family who are caught up in the false religion of Roman Catholicism, uh, give that and pray for them. Pray that God opens their hearts and minds and brings them out of that false religion and brings them to the knowledge of the true gospel. So... We're going to... Uh, last week, we, uh, we talked about... Uh, the papacy, uh, the current uh, infatuation uh, the world and the United States and evangelical Christianity seems to have with the Pope. And uh, we addressed some of those issues. And so we're con going to continue in the tradition of Protestantism. We are going to continue in our protest of Roman Catholicism today by uh, uh, discussing and talking about uh, one of their very uh, aberrant teachings, which has has only grown uh, since the Reformation and has only uh, gotten worse, and that is all their infatuation with with Mary and their basic uh, deifying of Mary. Uh, my wife often says the Roman Catholic Church, uh, and she as a Ro former Roman Catholic. Uh, says that the Roman Catholic Church is uh, is more about the Church of Mary today than the Church of Jesus Christ. So <clears throat> the one thing that you will discover the more you look into Roman Catholicism, when you look at w w indulgences, you, know, you look at uh, the doctrine of purgatory, uh, the, the, the Mass, wh whatever it is, these all attack the finished work of Christ they they say it wasn't complete you know purgatory Christ hasn't 
perfected you for all time, as Scripture tells us, Hebrews 10, 14. Uh, so you need to go to purgatory and have uh, the venial sins that, um, and it's, it's amazing, They'll, you talk to one priest and you talk to another, uh, the list of what, what's venial and what's mortal is uh, kind of a, a fluid thing. But uh, uh, so you have to go to purgatory and, and pay for the sins that uh, that you uh, were not able to uh, to take care of with the sacramental system uh, on this earth. And it really attacks just the finished work of Christ. Uh, Christ's sacrifice was not sufficient within the Roman Catholic system. And the thing that we're going to look at today is that according to uh, Roman Catholicism today, m Christ's mediation and his intercession for us is also not sufficient. Um, <clears throat> his understanding, uh, for example, Hebrews says that um, uh, he was in all ways like as we are, uh, yet without sin. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, uh, you know, he made himself lower than the angels, and he he identifies with us, but Roman Catholicism would teach that that Jesus doesn't quite understand us enough. He doesn't he doesn't um, have sufficient understanding of what we go through, and so Mary has to come in as as kind of that mediator between us and Jesus, and then Jesus, you know, mediates with the Father, and it's uh, it really just uh, uh, it, it once again is just an attack on. Uh, the finished and complete work of Christ and the perfect work of Christ. As a Christian, my standing before God stand, uh, is, is final and complete. When Jesus died on the cross for me, he said it was finished. He completed it to tell us die, paid in full. Um, and, I, and also his mediation before God, the Father, is perfect. The Father never rejects his mediation for me and for all of those who believe and trust in him. He never fails in his mediation for his people. And so, so the first thing I want to discuss here with, um, with the uh, Marian infatuation of the Roman Catholic Church <clears throat> is, is, first of all, the fact that they, they pray to Mary. The, the issue with this um, act of, of praying to, to Mary is that prayer is something biblically that is given alone to God. We see nowhere in Scripture where prayer is offered by believers to anyone other than God. And to offer prayer to any person or being other than God is to ascribe attributes of God alone to that person or being. And I'll explain that uh, here in a little bit. Now, in defense of, uh, you know, we want to properly represent what Roman Catholicism teaches. Now, Roman Catholics would actually say that they do not worship uh, Mary, that they do not... Pr they do not uh, give her the same level of worship that they give to Jesus or to uh, God the Father or the Holy Spirit, that they give a lower level of veneration to her, that they venerate her, that they don't worship her. Well, that's fine. I mean, you can say that, but the fact that you are simply praying to her means that you are ascribing um, aspects of deity to her. First of all, how is it possible for a creature, for a creation of God, to be able to, um, at least she, she must have some level of omnipresence because there are Roman Catholics all over the entire planet that pray to Mary at the same time. Millions of Roman Catholics praying to Mary at the same time. So does Mary have some aspect of... Uh, omnipresence, that she has this ability to hear these prayers. Now, 
what Roman Catholics will often do, and I've heard this defense before, is they will go to um, Hebrews uh, chapter 12. Uh, let me pull up this text here. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. It says, uh, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So they will say, well, you know, we're surrounded by the saints. We're surrounded by um, like Mary. And so they can hear our prayers and uh, and they can petition God on behalf of us. Well. Here's the thing. Contextually, what the writer of Hebrews is actually talking about is he just completed what we know as the Hall of Faith. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 is just a list of one after the other of the saints of the Old Testament who walked by faith and who were justified by faith. And, and we often call it the Hall of Faith. And so after going through all of these heroes of the faith who have gone on before us he says the writer of hebrews says therefore since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses uh, we have so many of these people that have gone before us and walked faithfully and persevered and endured to the end let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely let us run with endurance the race that is set before us so this text here doesn't have anything to do whatsoever with uh, the Bible teaching us that we can pray and petition uh, those who have uh, died and gone before us in the faith. Um, it's it's just it's a manufacturing it from the text. It's just not there uh, whatsoever. Uh, the other issue that I would have with uh, praying to Mary is that. Uh, she must have some level, and, and, and I, I want to be careful how I say this, because I want to make sure that you guys understand that when I say Mary, I'm referring to not the Mary in the Bible. She was a woman blessed by God. She was a faithful servant of God, which we should emulate and we should follow, and we should revere her in the same way that we revere other of the faithful uh, saints of God who have gone on before us. So when I when I say Mary, I'm not impugning the the true Mary of the Bible. I am I am talking about the uh, obviously the the Roman Catholic aberration of of Mary. Uh, were were Mary even aware of what is going on on Earth in her name? Uh, she would she would absolutely weep with with. Um, with with sadness that that uh, that she is being uh, venerated in this way, um, she is saved by the grace of God just like we are, and and her worship and her adoration is for God alone, and so uh, were she even aware of this, I'm sure uh, the Lord has protected her from any sort of knowledge of this, but. Um, so, so the Mary of Roman Catholicism, if she is capable of, of understanding and processing these millions of prayers simultaneously offered all around the world in different languages to her, then she must also have some aspect of omniscience. And so what, what the Roman Catholic Church is doing is they are giving Mary aspects of deity and this is just pure idolatry. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Um, in Isaiah, God says, I give my glory to no other. Uh, he's not giving any aspect of his glory to the Mary of Roman Catholicism. And it's just pure idolatry what they're doing. Uh, and so that's why Roman Catholics need to be evangelized. They are uh, idolaters. Uh, that do not believe in a finished work of Christ. They do not have the gospel. And so we as Christians should be giving them the gospel and praying for God to bring them to repentance and faith uh, through our proclamation of the truth. And so we give them the truth. 
because uh, it is the truth of the gospel by which we are saved. Romans chapter 10, how will they know unless, uh, unless the hearing comes by faith? Uh, or faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we give people the word of God. Um, so the, the next thing I want to discuss is uh, the four dogmas uh, of the four Marian dogmas, which are uh, outlined in the uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church. And they are that uh, Mary is uh, Theotokos, uh, the mother of God, uh, that she was, that's the first one, uh, her, per, that she was perpetually a virgin, uh, that she was immaculately conceived, and uh, that she was assumed into heaven is the fourth one. So let's look at the, the first one, that uh, Mary is Theotokos. Uh, this was, this term actually comes from the Council of Ephesus in 431 where she was referred to as Theotokos. Now, the purpose of uh, the Council of Ephesus was to establish uh, the hypostatic union, uh, what we know as the hypostatic union, that, that, that Jesus had a fully divine nature and he had a fully human nature joined into the one person of Jesus Christ. Fully divine, fully human, in the one person of Jesus Christ. And so there... They're referring to Mary as Theotokos was for the purpose of defending the deity of Christ, uh, of saying that the person of Christ was God in flesh. Uh, it was not to establish that Mary was the source of the divine nature of Christ. She was not the source of the divine nature of Christ. Um, in fact, uh, she... Uh, was the source of the human nature of Christ. And so the logical syllogism used by the Roman Catholic Church to argue that she is the mother of God is, uh, is Mary is the mother of Jesus. Jesus is God. Therefore, Mary is the mother of God. Now, the syllogism is, is, uh, is logical and is, uh, does have a uh, correct conclusion if the if the premises are true but the problem is that there is a fallacy of equivocation going on here it's a denial of the distinction that we as Christians um, Jesus is God yes but Jesus as the person who walked on this earth has two natures and so the syllogism equivocates the human nature with the divine nature and it uh, confuses these aspects and so therefore it does not logically follow and so, so the first dogma that um, she is the mother of God fails. She is not the mother of the triune, immutable, eternal, uh, transcendent nature of God. Uh, how could a created being, created by God, be the mother of the nature of God? And so she is the mother of the human nature of Christ. Uh, the claim uh, that uh, Mary was uh, perpetually a virgin. Uh, in let's let's see what Scripture says. In Matthew chapter one, uh, let me pull it up here. Uh, beginning at verse 24, when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So in scripture, the term knew means to know uh, is, is often used. For example, in Genesis, it says that Adam knew his wife Eve, and she brought forth a son. So it's referring to um. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's the Greek word. I didn't actually look up the Greek. I think it's the word uh, gnosko. But um, <clears throat> he knew her in a very personal way. And it says, but he knew her not until she gave birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. So uh, he did uh, know her at some point in a sexual way. And we can see also in Matthew uh, chapter 13, verse 55, where the let's actually pull that up uh, verse 55 
in Matthew chapter 13. Uh, it was uh, Jesus being uh, rejected in his hometown of Nazareth because these people knew him. This is where he grew up. And um, so they were saying in his hometown, they were saying, Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother Mary? And are not his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So Jesus had both brothers and sisters, and they're explicitly named in Scripture. So the dogma of the perpetual virginity of Mary is just, <laughs> um, is just completely anti-biblical. Um, in Mark chapter 6, verse 3, we see the synoptic uh, example of the same uh, story. And here again, is, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, uh, Joseph, Judas and Simon and are not his sisters here with us and they took offense at him so once again confirmed Jesus had um, brothers and sisters and that Joseph did know her in a sexual way after she brought forth her firstborn son uh, the third dogma is that is that Mary was immaculately conceived without his sin nature. Uh, however, Scripture just refutes this. It says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And this includes Mary. Mary herself um, uh, conceded her need of a Savior. Only sinners need saviors. So when you do hear a Roman Catholic speak of the Immaculate Conception, often we as Christians think they're talking about the conception of Christ. But that's not what they're talking about. They're actually talking about the conception of Mary. They also would teach that, um, that she was bodily taken up into heaven. And this was established in uh, 1950. So... It took us um, almost, uh, well, it took us about 1,900 years before we could come to understand that, that Mary was, was simply assumed into heaven and that she never died. Um, because scripture tells us that the wages of sin is death. Uh, so, so the soul that sins will die. Um, now, we have examples in the Old Testament of Elijah and Enoch who walked with the Lord and he was not for the Lord took him. And we have uh, Elijah who also went up. But there's no scriptural basis for uh, for this for Mary. So it's just completely absent from scripture. So those are the four Marian dogmas. Now, the thing that um, is interesting is that right now, um, as we speak, there is a petition uh, going on among Roman Catholics uh, to the Vatican, and um, and uh, they're petitioning Pope France, Francis. Uh, there's an electronic petition even available online to establish a fifth Marian dogma, and this one is even worse than the previous four. And this one is to establish the papal definition of Mary as co-redemptrix. And mediatrix. So she, Mary, according to many Roman Catholics today, and they even want to establish it as the fifth dogma, is that is that Mary is what is our co-redeemer. She was involved in the redemption of of God's people from their sins. I, this is just. I, I, it, make, it makes me want to wrap duct tape around my head. Uh, this is just such an attack on the work of Christ. And then uh, they can't even stop there. She's She is a part of the redeeming work. She is co-redemptrix. But they have to take Christ's mediation, his function as our eternal high priest, who offered himself as a sacrifice to protect, perfect us for all time and then he mediates for those for whom he made the sacrifice and they have to hone the catholic mary into uh being a mediator between god and man also and 
if we look at uh, 1 Timothy 2, uh, chap uh, verse 5, it says, There is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, what Roman Catholics will often say is that, well, Mary mediates between, Jesus Mar uh, mediates between uh, uh, the Father, but Jesus mediates between us, or, or Mary mediates between us and Jesus. Uh, here's the thing, the text completely refutes that. There is only one mediator between God, here's God, and here we have man, and there's one mediator in here, and that is the man Christ Jesus. So there's, there's, there's only one between God and man. There's no Mary in here, or the saints, or anyone else. So scripture just completely refutes this, this claim uh, that, that Mary is, our, is a mediatrix. And what we'll do here is I'm going to go through uh, some of the uh, apparitions that have been uh, showing up around the world and uh, claiming to be uh, Mary and, uh, and giving us all kinds of messages. The, uh, the, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to primarily look at uh, three of them. Uh, we're going to talk about the, the, one of the first ones, which was in uh, Guadalupe, uh, Mexico in 1531. And this is just um, a few years after the Protestant Reformation started. Uh, these uh, apparitions started showing up. Uh, but what we want to do is look at what Scripture uh, says and why we need to be so careful. So Roman Catholics are so caught up in these angelic uh, uh, Mary uh, apparitions that are showing up. But let's look at what... Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 11. It says, uh, beginning in verse 13, it says, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And uh, the, the one thing uh, also, and before I even go on to the next verse here, is this here itself uh, is, is a verse addressing um, what the Roman Catholic teach, Church teaches as apostolic succession. They believe that the Pope of Rome is uh, the succession of the seat of Peter and, uh, and that all Roman Catholic priests are apostles uh, that have uh, in a succession all the way from the early church to the present day um, are apostles of Christ. But um, what I would say is that this verse is referring to them. It says they're uh, false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. But let's keep on going here in verse 14 now. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it should be no surprise to us in verse 15. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness and their end will correspond to their deeds. So Satan can disguise himself as an angel of light. It also says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where uh, Paul is warning the Thessalonians and, and all of us as Christians the coming of the lawless one. And it says in verse uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. And so, Paul is acknowledging and warning us here that there will be false signs and wonders uh, that um, uh, occur, but uh, these are not, not of God. Okay, so the first uh, Marian apparition I want to look at is the one that did happen in Guadalupe, Mexico. And I have uh, the different quotes available, and we're just going to go through this. Uh, you can find this uh, online. Uh, 
there is a website uh, for this uh, by the Roman Catholic Church. I, did, I got this from one of their own sites. So these, these are the things that the apparition uh, uh, told um, a young boy um, by the name of Juan. Juan Inato, I think was his uh, uh, was his name. And uh, he had a... Uh, uh, an apparition appear to him and let's just look at some of the things that she said and just compare this to the Word of God so this was in 1531 in Guadalupe Mexico now know for sure my dearest littlest and youngest son that I am the perfect and ever virgin Holy Mary mother of the God of truth Wow, is if that's not a string of blasphemy that I've that I've ever heard. So she's she's perfect. And now, do I believe that we are perfected when we are in heaven? Yeah, Mary is perfect now. But that's not what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. So contextually what Roman Catholicism teaches is that Mary was always perfect. Um she is the ever virgin. We just completely refuted that with scripture. She's also the holy Mary, mother of God. So she is holy, um, giving herself the, the title of Holy Mary and then also Mother of the God of Truth, uh, Theotokos. Um, it also says here, I will give him, uh, speaking of God, to the people in my personal love, in my compassion, in my help, in my protection, because I am truly your merciful mother. Now, what Scripture tells us in Isaiah, or not Isaiah, but uh, Psalm 46, verse 1, it says that God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. Not Mary. It um, also says, goes down a little bit further, it says, My lovers who love me, those who seek me, those who trust in me. So, you know, in Scripture... The Bible teaches us that we should trust alone in Christ, uh, not in Mary. She also says down here further that she wishes him to build me a temple here on the plain. So she's asking for a temple to be built in her honor. Um, not only does Scripture say that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost, that uh, he does, that uh, that God Himself <laughs> no longer dwells in temples made with hands, but um, and even Solomon, when he built the temple, acknowledged that uh, his temple could not contain the God of creation. But that was a type and shadow, an example of God himself tabernacling among us and him indwelling his people. And so we are now the temple of God. But this is not a temple for, this is a temple built in honor of Mary herself, which is, once again, just an example of idolatry. Um she also says, uh, tells him to plead my cause and with your help and through your mediation that my will be fulfilled. Um, we as Christians pray for the will of God to be fulfilled, not for the will of Mary to be fulfilled. Once again, she says a little bit further down, I am the ever virgin, holy Mary, mother of God. Um, this one here was interesting. Uh, I am not here. I am who am your... I, who am your mother, are you not under my shadow and protection? Am I not the source of your joy? Are you not in the hollow of my mantle, in the crossing of my arms? Do you need anything more? Yeah, yeah, we need Christ. That is what we need. We need so much more than the Roman Catholic um, Mary. Once again, in Psalm 46, that God is our refuge and our strength. Uh, we rest under the shadow of his wing, not in the hollow of Mary's mantle. So that was uh, the apparition in Guadalupe. Now we want to look at the apparition uh, that appeared in, uh, in Fatima, Portugal. And I'm not going to go through all of the different uh, things that were said here, but but um, 
first, the way that it happened in Fatima is in 1916, first an angel appeared. Um, and we've already looked at scripture that Satan himself can appear as an angel of light. So an angel appeared first to uh, um, to several children at the age of 9, 8, and 6. Uh, there was a Lucia, uh, a Francisco, and a Jacanita uh, were the, the three children who, um, who saw this... Um, this uh, this angel and it says uh, this angel instructs them to pray this way the hearts of Jesus and Mary are attentive to the voice of your supplications so this apparition is bringing Mary up to the level of Jesus in the in the uh, as, as a recipient of our prayers and our supplications it says um, also, it says, and through the infinite merits of his most sacred heart, speaking of Jesus, and the immaculate heart of Mary. So Mary, I guess, has infinite merits that can be applied to us. Um, it says, it also instructs them to take the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, horribly outraged by thankless men, recover their sins and comfort your God. So it's just perpetuating this false belief that uh, it's talking about take the body and blood. It's talking about transubstantiation, the mass. It's just take uh, take this. So once again, it is uh, affirming the false teaching of transubstantiation. And uh, also further down, it says here, uh, the um, this is actually now the appearance of uh, Mary herself. She instructs them to recite the rosary every day to obtain peace for the world and the end of the war. This was uh, during the time of World War I. Now, interestingly enough, Scripture tells us that between the time of Christ's first coming and his second coming, that you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you are not alarmed, this must take place. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And so in, um, in Jeremiah 6, verse 14 also, it's speaking of those, uh, this was when Jeremiah was pronouncing judgment uh, and saying that uh, uh, he, was, he was actually prophesying that Nebuchadnezzar would come from Babylon and, and enact judgment upon uh, Jerusalem and on Judah. And uh, he, was, he was saying that... Uh, the false prophets and priests uh, and the people were saying falsely, um, they have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And uh, as you look through here, especially through the Fatima uh, apparitions, is that she kept promising peace and the end of war if we do certain things and we we devote ourselves to her immaculate heart. Um, and so we can see scripturally that the Bible does not promise us any peace until Christ himself comes and establishes peace. And uh, uh, those of my post-mill friends out there, uh, yeah, no, that's, that's, what the Bible, um, yeah, that's what the Bible teaches. Um, so it says... Uh, here in the second uh, appearance, and this was in June 13 of 1917, uh, it says, uh, He wants to use you to establish in the world a devotion to my immaculate heart. I promise salvation to those who embrace it. Wow. I mean, I, I don't even know what else to say. This is obviously for any Christian, anyone filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, knowing that we've been saved by the work of Christ, to say that I promise salvation to those who embrace it. Um, here salvation is being offered by giving devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and not to uh, a trust in the finished work of Christ. It says here a little bit further, it says, My Immaculate Heart will be your refuge and through it uh, will conduct you to God. Um, 
down here further also it says uh, oh my Jesus I offer this love of thee for the conversion of poor sinners and in the reparation for all the sins committed against the immaculate heart of Mary she was telling them on how to pray uh, so that our sins I guess are not against the eternal unchanging divine nature of God but our what what is sins that we need to be have reparation made for is those committed against the immaculate heart of Mary. Now, that's uh, that's all I'm going to touch on on the apparition in Fatima. the The next one that I am going to address now. I do want to note that uh, the Roman Catholic Church has uh, not. Uh, condoned this particular one and this is the one in Medjugorje the reason I'm going to bring this one up though is because um, among a lot of Roman Catholics today this is still a very very popular uh, because it's actively going on today this is in Medjugorje uh, part of Bosnia um, where there have been if I remember right three or five uh, beginning as young children um, uh, both girls and boys uh, have grown up always and have been receiving messages from this particular apparition. And they're they're uh, even as recent as if you go to their website Medjugorje.org. I mean, you can see messages uh, from September 25th. Uh, Margia received a message. Uh, um, uh, here was another apparition to Mirjana, um, and it gives a message uh, once again. And so we're going to go over some of these messages. And let me actually pull those up. I had uh, documented these uh, several years ago. Um, and so I just want to pull these, these up. The reason that I want to bring this one up, even though this has not been sanctioned by uh, the Roman Catholic Church, is that a lot of Roman Catholics are following this. And in fact, I even have a uh, family who uh, is caught up in this particular one so that's why I do want to bring it up but uh, let's uh, let's pull this up and I'm gonna get some direct quotes here um, here's one uh, this this one was from actually I don't even have a date on this one that's interesting uh, most of them have dates on, but these are all pulled directly from Medjugorje.org from their website. They they list all the the messages given by these apparitions since the beginning, and um, it says uh, here at the beginning, dear children, when someone comes to you and asks you a favor, answer by by giving. I find myself before so many hearts which do not open themselves to me. Pray so that the world willingly wants to accept my love. Uh, dear children, I'm coming among you because I desire to be your mother, your intercessor. Uh, I desire to be the bond between you and the Heavenly Father, your mediatrix. What did we just read in First uh, Timothy 2.5? That there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. She is not our mediatrix. Uh, this is just utter blasphemy. On May 25th, 2011, uh, she said here, Only in this way can I help you hear your prayers and seek intercession before the Most High. And that's really just what all of this um, just goes through here. Just talks about her interceding before the Most High. Just repeatedly, uh, she refers to herself as the Queen of Peace. Uh, once again, Scripture saying that the, you know they will say peace, peace when there is no peace. It's a false peace, a peace not given by God. Um, they refer to uh, on their website. I copied some quotes from the website where they refer to her as the Queen of Heaven in several places, uh, the Queen of Angel and Saints. They call her the Mediatrix. Um, so these are. Uh, these are issues that are very, very serious, and they um, are an attack upon uh, the finished work of Christ. 
And so those of you out there that um, have family and friends and that are caught up in this, please uh, let them either listen to this episode or, or look up this information. Uh, take the Bible. Uh, show them what the Bible says. Uh, warn them of God's judgment against those who impugn both his uh, character, who impugn the finished work of Jesus Christ. Um, uh, give them the gospel. Um, and pray for their repentance. I mean, uh, here's the thing. We as Christians, we must pray. It is God who brings people to repentance and faith. It's not us. It's God. It's a work of God. And so um, my, my prayer would be that you would, you would uh, do your research on this, gather the information, go and give Catholics who are caught up in this false uh, worship and give them the true gospel, give them the truth, and pray, pray, and pray that God brings them to repentance and faith in Him alone. Thank you for joining us today. Join us next week. We're going to start talking about the doctrines of grace. Don't you know that the unjust will not inherit God's kingdom? And through Adam's offense